Welcome to We Create, the podcast that brings to light creative projects in our community. My name is Linda Salzer, and in today's episode, we'll be spinning a yarn with my very special guest, Julie Moline. Playing off a successful career as a magazine editor and writer, Julie has spent nearly 40 years working with corporations, startups, and nonprofits in the U.S. and Europe. She has particular expertise in the travel, architecture, finance, and healthcare industries, staying active as a contributor to publications in these fields. One of her favorite assignments was speech writing for Sir Richard Branson. Julie moved from New York City to Salem, New York in 2009 and to nearby Easton in 2015. Julie, what drew you to upstate New York? from New York City. I was really taken by how beautiful it is up here. I had come upstate to go to college, and when I was doing a lot of travel writing, I ended up on a lot of press trips in this area, Lake George to the north, Saratoga Springs to the west, and Manchester to the east. So I knew about the topography and just the glorious vistas and the pretty farmhouses So when it was time for me to buy a house in the country, this was the kind of country I wanted to live in. Well, I can certainly understand that because that's what drew me up to this area as well. The people are pretty great, too. A lot of creatives, so I feel right at home here. Well, this area really is sort of a mecca for fiber artisans and producers. People around here raise their own animals, alpacas, sheep, and goats, and they produce a lot of high-quality wool and turn it into yarn. Right. I I thought it was kismet that the day that I was looking for a house, so the very first time I was house hunting, Mm -hmm. it was the weekend of the Fiber Festival. And I I didn't know it existed. And as I was driving around looking at houses, I was seeing all of these signs for the Fiber Tour. So Mm -hmm. I figured that was a sign that this was the right place for me. Absolutely. So can you tell me, uh, when did you discover your love for knitting? I can tell you exactly when. I was eight years old. Uh, My family was living in Buffalo, and my aunt, who owned a yarn store in Miami, came up for a visit, and she brought her knitting with her. And I was absolutely transfixed by what she was doing. I was also transfixed by her because she was the most glamorous woman I had ever seen. Mm-hmm. And she showed me how to knit, and from then it was, it became a passion. I mean, even that young, I was interested in all of the different elements involved in knitting. So it's texture, it's the, all the sensuous things about yarn, the way it smells, the way it smells, all the different colors. So I don't have any art training, being able to create something that's beautiful Mm-hmm. It is something that's really important to me. So I'll never be a painter, but I can be painterly with my choices of color. And and all of the aspects of knitting I found fascinating. So not just the, the tactile elements or the math that's involved. Um, I never thought when I was taking geometry that calculating slope would ever be useful in my life, but it really is. Especially oh, it is? Doing something like a, like a raglan sleeve on a sweater. Uh Um, But the history of knitting is fascinating. And so as I got older and I was getting more and more obsessed with knitting, I started reading about the history of knitting, the social history, and the the kind of art history involved with it. And, And feeling this strange connection to the people who figured it out in an age when there were no computer programs to help you with pattern design, there were no electric lights. If you wanted yarn, you would pretty much have to make it yourself. And all of this engineering was fascinating to me. Like, if you look at how a sock is constructed, imagine in uh, at a time when people weren't taught how to read and they would somehow figure out how to do this very complicated turning and – I. I don't know if engineering is the right word, but the the way that they were able to to figure this out, Mm -hmm. creating a tube using four sticks 
and very skinny yarn to make a sock that's mm-hmm. shaped perfectly for a foot, going up a slim ankle and swelling a little bit to accommodate a calf. I mean, mm-hmm. all of this was fascinating to me. And so as I got more skilled and I started doing more complicated things myself, the obsession just grew. And so Really? Yeah, 50 years later, I'm still <laughs> fascinated by, by all of this. So um, I think my aunt would be really proud. Well, your work is beautiful. Uh, I first met you, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you were uh, at a craft fair and you were selling some of the hats that you had made, and they were just beautiful. Mm-hmm. I was taken by them. And oh, uh, you. You, you you really are terrific. Uh, your work is, is useful, and it's just beautiful. I get a lot of compliments when I wear your hat. That's one of the things about knitting that's really pleasing to me that you can make something that's beautiful and like you said useful um, absolutely th- there's no reason why something utilitarian like a hat or a scarf has to be plain it doesn't have to be over the top either but that's part of the fun of creating something um out of two sticks and a string mm-hmm. um is is <laughs> that you can you can transform something into an object of of utility and beauty, and it, it's got more uh, practical applications than some of the other applied arts that I like to do, like mosaics um, mm-hmm. and and embroidery. So you know, it's portable art basically, wearable art. When you start something that you're going to knit, do you know what it's going to look like? When it's finished, do you have that in mind already, or is it something that d- develops as, a, as you go along? Well, most of the work that I'm doing now is hats because I've created this little side business, and that's what people know me for, and so that's that's basically what I've been doing. Um, so I have a very clear picture of what I'm doing, how it's going to look, how long it's going to take, what yarns to use. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to doing something like a shawl or a sweater, um, if I'm designing it, I, I draw a schematic, but very often the, the beast will take <laughs> its own <laughs> shape, and, and I might make modifications as I go. Mm-hmm. Um, I might have imagined a crew neck, and then I decided to make it a funnel neck, mm-hmm. or um, I get bored with it, so all of a sudden a sweater is now cropped. Um, <laughs> or um, I start making a scarf and I realize it's not working, but it's a great swatch for a hat or a sweater or a baby mm-hmm. blanket or something like that. So um, sometimes they really take a life of their own, and the yarn might tell me whether I'm on the right track or not. Because sometimes, especially if I'm using a yarn I haven't used before, when I start working with it, I realize that the drape might be wrong or I've picked the wrong mm-hmm. needle size or mm-hmm. it just doesn't look good or it doesn't feel good. I mean, weirdly, sometimes the ball might feel soft and squishy, but mm-hmm. when you start knitting with it, it just doesn't feel the same way. And conversely, sometimes I touch a, a ball of yarn or a skein of yarn and it doesn't feel like it's going to be nice against your skin, which is important for scarves, um, not so mm-hmm. important for hats. Um, unless you're bald, um, and um, when I knit it up, it's suddenly lovely to feel, or it might be a little bit scratchy, but once it's washed oh. and dried and mm-hmm. the yarn blooms a little bit, um, and, and some yarns bloom more than others, and by blooming, I mean the, the stitches swell after they've been oh. dipped in water. Um, so mm-hmm. I never really know for sure um, whether what I'm doing is going to be how I imagined it, unless I've done it before mm. and can completely recreate all of the all of the factors, the needle size and the um, the, the actual size of the of the garment that I'm making. I was, I was just thinking about you know the, the blooming. Sometimes, oh yeah, um, when you are making something, a, a big garment, like a sweater, yeah. and you haven't factored in the bloom, um, you can run into some real trouble. If you've ever seen somebody wearing a sweater with sleeves that go down to the ankle, um, <laughs> that's what happens. 
<laughs> right? Because sweaters stretch, and some yarn isn't elastic enough to snap back after it's been wet. So you have to factor that in, too, when you're doing your, your calculations. You know, uh, as you were talking about fabric not returning to its original state, I was thinking of when I had a, a – it was a beloved wool sweater, and uh, I think I – put it into the dryer or something, and uh, or washed it, and it, it shrank. And so I, I remember putting on the sweater and getting into the shower, hoping to stretch it out. Mm-hmm. That just didn't work. Did it work? <laughs> no, it didn't yeah. work. No. Yeah. I mean, if it was a wool sweater, um, microscopically you can see these uh, little hooks in the yarn, yeah. and the hooks attach to each other. And that's what causes the shrinkage. I mean, that's yeah. another thing about what's so fascinating about knitting is mm-hmm. you can spend a lot of time reading about different sheep breeds and how their yarns, the yarns that are made from from them, are very different from one another. So, um, so you know, some wool, like in the Shetland Islands. Mm-hmm. Um, might have a completely different feel or, or even a characteristic than merino yarn from Australia. So you have to really understand how the yarns behave um, when they've been knitted. There are different ways that they're spun, and mm-hmm. that also changes how the fabric behaves when you finish knitting it. So this is all part of those variables I was talking about before, about how you have to really understand how the yarn behaves that you know how many stitches to cast on and i mean it it's, it ends up being very very complicated well um, how do you keep so track of that how, how do, as a professional knitter i mean you're much better than i have ever been in my life in knitting so uh, how do you keep track of counting and making sure you're stopping at the correct place in order to uh, make your whatever you're making shape the way it's supposed to be yeah well i do too um Sometimes I go on automatic pilot and I realize I've knitted way beyond where I should have stopped or mm-hmm. um, I've made a mistake and, and I wasn't paying attention because I was like in the Zen mode. And then I realize I have to rip out two inches to, to fix the mistake. Well, how far would you rip it out? Was it, if you noticed you made a mistake, you know, uh, six inches worth of a sweater, would you go back or would you leave it there? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it depends. If... If it shows, I've come to the point where um, I, I I won't fix it if it doesn't show, let me put it that way. Mm. But if it's going to show or if it's going to throw something off, like if you're doing a cable and you and you miss the stitch, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's very obvious. Or if yeah. you drop the stitch pretty far down, yeah. um, especially in a textured pattern, you really have to rip it out. So there's a – an understanding that most knitters have that it, if if you've got to fix something down below, you've got to suck it up and yeah. rip it down. And it's called it's called frogging oh. because you go rip it, rip it. <laughs> so yeah. when I'm when I'm painting, I deliberately leave a small portion of the room not correct, you know, not painted or whatever, because I want that gives me permission not to shoot for 100% perfection. Yeah. There's, I heard this story about these knitters in Russia who make shawls out of very, very fine silk filaments. So they're on teeny tiny needles, like the Mm. circumference of a toothpick. Wow. And when they're finished, at the edge, they knit in a strand of their hair. Oh, really? So they're deliberately making it imperfect yeah. on the edge because only God is allowed to be perfect. That's right. But every other stitch, every other thing that they've done in this sweater <laughs> is perfect. And they sell them and they they sell for astronomical amounts because mm-hmm. it might take six or eight months to make a single garment. Mm. Um, but I am not that fussy. And um if I've made a mistake in a hat, I mean, hats are so small that I might lose a couple hours at the yeah. most. But sometimes if sometimes if you make a mistake, you can fix it. And so I try to fix it, but I've found that trying to fix it and then continuing on and then looking back at the fix and seeing that the fix is terrible makes me want to rip it out. So 
More often more than not, I just rip. And try not to cry. Don't cry. It <laughs> <laughs> takes the fun away from knitting. So, well, do you knit by yourself, or do you uh, go to a knitting circle, or what, what do you do? Well, when I'm in New York City, um, I try to go to a knitting circle because it's it's fun to hang out with my knitting friends from back when I was living in New York uh, mm -hmm. full time. Up here, there was a knitting group I used to go to on Tuesday nights at a, a place called Simple Pleasures, which is run by a woman who raises her own sheep and goats. And so she she makes a yarn that's a combination of mohair from the goats and mm -hmm. lamb's wool from her sheep. Mm -hmm. And she also does her own dyeing. And I think she grows her own plant for the dyeing. Um, and, and I look forward to those Tuesday nights because I had just moved up here. I didn't know anybody. And mm -hmm. this was my way of becoming part of the community and the women in this group were all fabulous um really great fun so um i loved going up there to knit but i wouldn't get very much done because everybody was looking at everybody else's stuff <laughs> and, and gossiping and drinking wine and oh it sounds <laughs> wonderful were like yeah it was really fun that group disbanded when the woman who owned the place went back to work full time and she had a long commute and she'd come home and she, she had to take care of the animals and she was tired and it was just too much for her. But since she's retired, she's resurrected the knitting group and then COVID hit. So I haven't gone. Well, it sounds wonderful. A, a great way to get together and uh, have community and to share yeah. something that you really love. It, it's really great. Uh, I, and uh, as much as I love knitting by myself and, and I knit pretty much every day. I have orders to fill and um, experiments to do and I have a mountain of yarn just waiting to be made into something. Um, I, I do like knitting with other people and especially when I want to make something that's not a hat and I have questions about construction or if um, I, I just need advice about something so that I don't need to spend several hours figuring it out myself I can just mm -hmm. ask somebody who's an expert knitter and there are many many expert knitters here um, so sometimes I just go over to a friend's house and two of us knit so rather than a group it's just a duo mm -hmm. and that then you can really get a lot done um, but there, there's a woman up, up here who used to raise alpacas she just retired from the alpaca raising business who has morphed from knitting and she, she does stunning work including creating her own design but she switched to weaving so she set up a studio to with with her looms and i'm absolutely fascinated by what she's doing and her sense of color and texture mm -hmm. so um, i like to go to her place and watch her working on her loom and she spins her own yarn, so I watch her spin and have launched a new obsession. If somebody listening wanted to learn to knit, uh, what advice would you give them? There are amazingly fabulous tools on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend checking out Knitting for Beginners. There are a, a, a number of excellent podcasts that are either – created by yarn enthusiasts or uh, people who have yarn stores or or, or uh, they're in the business of producing yarns and and start there. Um, some ex, uh, extensions that universities have courses um, and there are knitting retreats that you can go to that are geared towards beginners. I, I think once COVID is um, vanquished or we're allowed to travel again, um, mm -hmm. even with restrictions. Uh, going on a yarn cruise might be kind of fun. And a yarn cruise. Uh, they're all, they're all, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't done one. A cousin of mine, who's also an avid knitter, uh, goes on them, and she has a blast. They go to Iceland, and then they visit Icelandic sheep wow. uh, producers, and they go to yarn studios, and they just have a blast. And you, you're sitting around knitting for eight hours a day and then socializing and doing tours and things like that. And it's fun to go to mills. It's really interesting mm -hmm. to see how the yarn gets made. Um, and then 
on these tours, whether it's a cruise or, or a land tour, um, the, the trip organizers often connect with local artists. So you can meet the people who are raising the plants for dyeing, and you can see people actually doing the dyeing, and then you can buy local yarn. And, and that's something that I, I think I'd like to do at some point. I don't have to go on a trip to do that. I can go. There's a, a, a spinnery here in Greenwich. That's, really? I don't know, 10 miles from my house. And there are many, many yarn producers around here. So you can go, and you don't have to go to Iceland to get Icelandic wool because there are people here in this area who raise Icelandic sheep specifically for that type of yarn. Really? I had no yeah. idea. Kind of a hidden treasure, Washington County, um, of yarn-related and knitting-related um, producers and, and artists. Well, Julie, it's been a, a great pleasure to have you on We Create. Thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure.